What's happening, Mark? How's it going, man? Uh, pretty good. You know, we did a couple, uh, I would consider powerful, powerhouse uh, sessions of reef therapy uh, related to, you know, uh, wild reefs and coloration. And I felt like mm, that was a lot to chew on uh, for one week. So, you know, last week we kind of relaxed and this week we're back at it. Mm hmm. Yeah, it was, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's good that we don't force it because like last week, uh, there was just too much going on and it would have been one of those like rushed, get in, make it happen. But, um, I don't know, you know, conversations shouldn't be like that where you force it. So I've actually been, um, I've been in reef therapy all afternoon talking to other people about this and that and the other. Nice. Yeah. Who you been, yeah. What's that? Who, who you've been chatting with? Um, I mean, I talked to Chris Meckley a lot and, yeah. um, I was just talking about uh, collecting some corals uh, later this year and, and sending them through him. And he was like, oh, yeah, no problem. As long as you, you know, let me cut a frag. I was like, dude, if you don't cut a frag, you're doing me a disservice, right? The reefer's code. You and I had that experience a long time ago where yeah. my tank wasn't ready. And I put a couple of uh, corals into your care. And that eventually spawned like the the first observation or documentation of the red bugs that we yeah, first thought were cool. Yeah. I still um, remember like looking at them with you in your tank 20 years ago and be like, oh my God, look, they're so cool. Little critters just running around the corals. And then over time we're like, oh no, that's not a good thing. You know, the worst casualty of that, and you reminded me, which by the way, listening to your uh, rapping with Reef Bum was good for me. That was like my reef therapy where I got to listen to that last week. Um, but, I'm so uh, jealous. I'm excited for your reef for your reef Bum interview so I can listen to it like it's my reef therapy. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. How, I mean, I'm not an SBS head anymore, and so... Um, you say that, but you love them. You I do love, love them. You're just them. not I just, like, like in a hardcore phase of growing them right now. True. Yeah. Um, but you were talking about Tyree and um, dynamic ecomorphology or whatever it was called back in the day. And it got me, it reminded me the worst casualty of the red bugs was I was on the wait list for um, Acropora solitariensis. The and first one, yeah. Just before FLOs were even on our radar. Yeah, and I remember, um, I think it was like a year or two out, right, that I was on the wait list, and then finally, uh, Tyree, you know, calls me, and I don't, I, you know, back in the Nokia phone days, I see this number, I don't recognize it from California, and the guy's like, hey, dude, I'm ready to ship your coral, and um, I was so stoked to have that coral, and um, one of the identifying factors that got me looking at the red bugs was that coral would not grow. And then, and I started, you know, looking into it, looking into it and, you know, analyzing it. And that's when I noticed those little red bugs. So, and it was one of the first casualties, right? Because it was just this little rectangle of, uh, Acropora and it's just, you know, failure to launch all the way because of those damn bugs. But, um, Anyway, it got me thinking about that when you uh, brought up uh, Dynamic Eco. So, yeah, that sucked. Yeah, the like, the days, worst but... time to get that coral, right? Like if I'd gotten it like six months later, <laughs> you know, put me back on the wait list. Now, anyway. Um, yeah. But, yeah, no, it was kind of cool uh, just chatting up with Chris and just always bringing up that reefer's code of just sharing is caring. And, uh, you know, back then, uh, not every coral was just a, f a frag of a frag of a frag, and it was a lot of wild colonies coming in. And, God, it was like standard issue, common practice. You get a new coral, unless it's an LPS, you cut a piece or two off for your friends uh, for safekeeping or at least your other tank. And that was just totally normal. That's what we did. I feel like uh, we need to inject a lot more of that into the dialogue, the discourse of what reefing is supposed to mean. It's harder now because back then, a frag, like an SPS frag, you you and your buddy could go in on one, and you know, usually there was like a little branch or something you could break off and uh, start a new frag of it, right? Um, and yeah, now absolutely. the frags are so tiny, like it's not like you and your buddy can go in on a single frag unless you're like, okay, you put it in your tank and then I'll wait a few months, you know? Um, yeah. But yeah. Anyway. Well, that's why I'm going collecting. I'm going collecting, hopefully 
to go collect all these oddball brown and unusual corals that just need to be, uh, you know, given some spotlight in a reef aquarium environment so they can truly shine. That's where the you idea. Go, where are you going collecting? Um, not super sure yet. I don't want to jinx it. Okay. Um, but I am going to Australia for reef stock. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to be there a couple of weeks after the show. So I am just, I've got a, you know, that window carved open, carved out nice. for, you know, whatever I can do. Excellent. So normally we do a lot of small talk and then do a, a big topic, but I kind of want to get the, the big fish out of the way. And I figured since there's, you know, I've written reviews about aquarium products and I've done videos about aquarium products, I'm like, hey, why don't I do an audio <laughs> review of the Radeon G6? Because I'm in between the review of the G6 Pro video that I um, pushed out yesterday. So make sure to go to you know, the Reef Builders YouTube channel to see that full comparison of the G6 and the G5 Pro. God, I, I put them through every pace possible, um, uh, comparing the spectrum, comparing each color channel, comparing the spread. And, um, I, you know, I think at the end of the day, it's up to the user whether it makes sense to, um, to upgrade to that light. You know, same as like the iPhone, there's a, there's tick cycles and there's stock cycles. And sometimes there's a lot of features and a, a new form factor that, you know, screams, Hey, this is a new product. And other times there's a lot of stuff going on under the hood and it's really more for the enthusiasts to, um, you know, really, uh, uh buy into the, the new generation. Yeah. I don't get the, uh, well, I, I can understand the frustration if you just bought you know, let's say G5, like you, there, you just got them and then a week later or a few days later, a new product announced. I could understand that a little bit, but at the end of the day, what you bought isn't a bad thing, you know? If the lights were on a more consistent cycle where you knew they were coming, you know, like, hey, uh, Ecotech's going to release a light in the next month or so, I, I'm going to hold off buying these G5. But that's hard to do at, I think, their scale. Like somebody like Apple can drop hints about, you know, their phone cycles and all that, I think, probably better. I don't know. I don't know anybody at Ecotech, but I just assume that it's harder to plan that stuff out, uh, you know, by a date. But um, but then when people get angry, I, I don't get that because, uh, you know, it's not like you bought a bad light. If you bought it three months ago, right, you right. Know? So, um, and well, if you're hardcore the enough, then, we then can... go buy the new ones and sell the old ones. And if you're not, and you're cool, and you can make peace with what you have, then cool. So, sorry. Um, so let me review the lights and just kind of tell you about them, and then I want to—I really want to dive into this strange, you know, these uh, these intangible characteristics about reef aquarium lighting and people's emotions uh, surrounding them. So um, the Radeon G6 compared to the, and we're just talking about the pro right now. Um, you know, I'm, I've just been looking under the hood for so long. It was really fun to discover that the reds are slightly different color. The greens are slightly different color. The blues are slightly different color. The purples are a little deeper. Um, it was clear, you know, that there is a new generation of ultraviolet light and a lot more violets. But when you look at them all separately, um, you see the difference. You know, they're not the exact same color. And I know they were all very carefully selected to do a specific job. Um, but the thing about the G6, the biggest difference is the spread right? Still just talking about the pro. Um, and it got me thinking, it's like, hmm, I kind of see a case for the G5 and the G6 or a G6 with a little bit more concentrated lenses, right? Because if the light is now being beamed sideways, like a lot, I feel like a, a lot of that could actually spill out of the tank. If you have it mounted a certain height above the aquarium, you know, if you have a two foot reef tank and you're really trying to grow acroporas, your intensity just went down. <laughs> you know what I mean? You lost some of that intensity. I'm like, God, I'm, I am, I am hoping and praying that the powers that be will find it necessary to give users the options to, uh, create a very uniform lens that just has a tighter beam angle. Like I don't need the light to spill all over the place, right? I know how to use it. I, I understand. First of all, 
this these changes were made based on user recommendation, like from all over the world. This is what people in general have been asking for, not the vocal minority who are keyboard crusaders, you know, pounding at their keyboard and they've never even owned a Radeon, but they want to throw some shade. Um, but um, yeah, the G6 is a great light. I it's you'll be hard to have a G6 next to the G5. You're just hard pressed to tell the difference. Although a certain um, mixed color spectrums, because they you know they have that Kelvin slider now that they reintroduced that used to be an Eco Smart Live, which I freaking love, um, because left to my own devices, I'll just turn on the channels that I know and usually kind of ignore the white. You know the warm white I use a lot, the blues, all the blues I use a lot, but the reds and greens I'll just I'll just throw ten or fifteen percent of the intensity at it just uh um as a knee jerk thing because it's there right um but uh yeah certain spectra because they're grouped on a certain on the same aquarium there's a little bit of different color rendition and you'll see it and the thing is though like if you have a G5 it's like the difference between having clear glass and ultra clear glass right you don't really know that you're missing it until you've had an ultra clear tank and if you don't keep your glass super clean what's the point of having an ultra clear glass aqu aquarium anyway right if your cores aren't like really looking at their peak you you'll be hard pressed to appreciate some of the nuances of like the new color rendition that's being brought out you know what i mean this is really for the enthusiast um now let me talk a little about the the blue because i think the radeon g6 blue is a totally different uh, ball of, of wax because there was those lime and cyan channels that no one was really fond of. Um, it was a fun experiment in trying to bring out more fluorescence, but now that they've um, uh, put the uh, reallocated that power and those LEDs into uh, more of the colors that we really use, especially the violets, especially the UV, oh my goodness, dude, I see a difference. I see a big difference because I had the G5 blue over a certain patch of corals for like the last three years. I know exactly what that light does over a certain tank. I moved it to, I moved the G6 blue to where the G5 blue was. Oh my goodness. I didn't think my blue hooks on my could get any brighter. It looks painted. It looks painted with acrylic paint right now. <laughs> it is so blue from top to bottom. And that's the other funny thing is like those violet and um, pigment stimulation colors are are great for blues, right? And I don't know, uh, you know, unless you're really into the acros, um, not too many folks are like specializing in blue colored corals and having a daylight spectrum um, that really shows off that blue. But the thing, if, if you got a Radeon Gen 5 blue, it's because you want that spectrum and you want it to do certain things. And I'll tell you what, the G6 blue, whew, man, and that's the crazy part. I went from G5 to G6, which drops the par because it's more spread out, but I'm getting even better colors on my acros. And that's that's actually quite impressive. Nice. So it's, I guess, exciting more pigments within the tissues that it's not that the color, the coral colored up more. It's just reflecting more color. Both. Both. Okay. I think it's bringing out more color and it's stimulating more color, right? So if the G, I mean, long term, I could series. see that coloration increase, but I mean, just the immediate response that you got was just that pigment oh excitation. i didn't look at it immediately oh okay i didn't really that's not my examination that i'm coming from i i put the light on and you know doing the reef aquarium work reef builders reef therapy all the things we've got interview going on right now i put the light on and i just like you know kind of glance at it. i'm like oh yeah cool it's on whatever um but it's on the same programming as before and uh it's like four or five days later i take a good hard look at it and i'm like holy crap mm. Holy gotcha. moly, this is insane. It, it, here's, it, I'm, I'm trying to come up with good analogies, right? And when I get a new phone, right, I'm not buying a new phone. I'm buying a new camera, right? I'm right. pretty much buying those features. And I kind of feel that same way about the Radeon G6 Blue. If you got the blue version, you want those colors to pop. You want to bring out more of those colors and stimulate more of those colors. So I feel like the G6 Blue is going to be um, a worthy upgrade. But I still do see some merit for a tighter 
a tighter beam angle, right? It spreads so far out that, you know, if you put this, you know, this, this fixture on a three foot tank, you're bouncing off the walls, right? And if you have crusty walls, then whatever, then you're just growing algae. If you have clean walls, they're going to get a little bit more internal reflection, which they mentioned in their documentation. But yeah, if, if you, if you got a blue version of the G5, it's because you're an enthusiast, right? Like an iPhone and a new version comes out and, uh, I want the better camera. I want the more, you know, fluorescent pigment stimulating spectrum, which they did. The, the interesting and, thing about these panel style lights now and their, their um, increased spread is that, um, for me, lights that I looked at, you know, like I'm not you, I don't get free, I, you know, like I pay for a lot of my equipment. And so I'm always like, Ooh, that's an expensive light, right? Like, Oh, that's kind of a pricey light for a six foot tank. But, um, and I'm not just talking about ecotech. I just mean, you know, when I look at a lot of these lighting options, um, but as the spread got better and better and better, even though the price went a little more, a little more, a little more, um, the whole story around the XR15, I think, is amazing because now they're more, from my point of view, affordable light fixture at a price point that I feel is fairly That's reasonable. What no one is suddenly talking about. becomes a player. You know, I mean, suddenly, yeah, I mean, I could, I could. It's easily, actually gotten cheaper to yeah, use radiance, exactly. right? If you yeah. had a four or five foot tank, uh, uh, well, three, four years ago, you would have had to spend about two thousand dollars on a pair right. of Gen Four XR30 Pros. Now. You can do the same thing for half the price. Exactly. $1,000 for a pair of XR15s. That is what people need to get in their heads and especially the, the you know, keyboard crusaders. Like the sticker price of the same fixture has gone up, but the value and the performance has also gone up by massive amounts. And I, like I said, I'll, I'll just keep saying this. This is kind of my chant this year. <laughs> it's like, no one should be getting XR30 except a guy I talked to yesterday who's doing a, what's he doing? A 12 foot reef tank. And I was like, well, you know, if you want better spread, you should get 25 uh, XR15s. I'm like, yeah, you know what? Never mind. Your tank's too big. That's a lot of wiring. <laughs> Go ahead and get yourself 12 of uh, the XR30s. Um, so yeah, I feel like that, that's an important thing to say is like the, the, the price of the, the specific model numbers has gone up, but there's not enough conversation about, wait, the XR15 has a lot of light now. Yeah, a whole it's, lot of it's light. like how a $30,000 Subaru became as fast as a supercar from like the 1990s, right? I mean, it's like if I was going to light my six-foot tank, I'd go with three XR15s. Um, uh, the other kind of appealing story about the XR30s is it's probably a bit of a stretch for somebody that's hardcore SBS or something. But for a guy like me, that's not too worried about having some bit of a hotspot. Cause I mean, we've been living with hotspots for a long time now, right? Um, I hate cords, right? I hate plugs, outlets. I want less crap to plug in. And could you, I mean, this is more a question for you. Like, could you light a six foot tank with two XR thirties? Yes. Unequivocally. Yes. So it's, it's not even a question. That's two plugs, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, you're going to have, it, it depends. It depends on also, right. As your acros grow and they become larger colonies, if you only have two point sources or, you know, two panel sources, right. but there's, you can still treat them as a point. You're going to have more self shading. But if you have a tank of LPS and zoanthids and shrooms and, yeah. um, a lot of LPS and some anacropores and, you know, for you acros strategically placed, yeah, two XR 30s will light a, a six foot tank. Two, we're talking about $2,000 to light a six foot aquarium, right? So we're getting away from, the G6 per, you know, specifically and talking more broadly about reef aquarium lighting. Do you remember how much a Giesman used to cost? Mm -hmm. A six foot fixture with three metal halides inside and built in, uh, T5s, five, six thousand dollars with the custom paid job. You probably would have had to buy two three foot fixtures, which were easily 2,500 each. Right. So you want to complain <laughs> about the you know, rising cost of, of LED lights. I'm like, you, do you remember how much lights? And then if you take factor in, you know, inflation, not recent, but over the last 20 years, oh my God, 
Mm-hmm. You know, the reefers and they might, the teenage reefer inside of me, like, just wishes that we had those lights back then. I would have had a lot more tanks. I would have gotten so much more mileage. And one of the other thing is, too, is like, you want to complain about a, a product being iterated soon? First of all, Ecotech Marine products are never on sale from Ecotech unless there's a new light around the corner, right? right? If you see 15% off or Ecotech Marine products, no matter what they say, it's, it's, I think with very few exceptions, that's usually been, you know, to help clear out some of the old inventory. And so that's almost like telegraphed, like, hey, there's a new light coming. So, you know, put that in your pocket and, you know, remember in a couple, in a couple of years from now. But on the one side, you have, you know, companies that are innovating and iterating um, quickly, and on the flip side, you have the dominant aquarium computer company in the United States, Apex uh, Systems. They are <laughs> Apex Systems, Neptune Systems. They haven't refreshed the Apex since 2016. Like, yeah. when did that thing come out? And that's supposed to be a computer. So, w- which one do you want? Do you want the products to be, you know, uh, refreshed, innovated, you know, quickly, so we can all enjoy uh, 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 more technological progress in things like testers, in things like uh, aquarium uh, controllers, or do you want them to just give you, you know, just five every five to ten years, right? So here's a, well, here's the this is a really interesting because Neptune is um, really locked into their product development cycle or lack thereof um they're getting leapfrogged right now they were one of the first out the gate not with the kh tester but with the the trident right to do calcium and magnesium right now interzoo is going on there is a a, just a slew of automatic water testing machines coming from all different companies you know one of the prominent ones that comes to mind is the refactory smart tester it's a small box it it is only going to use their reagents, but that one box you can use with calcium or magnesium or phosphate or nitrate, right? You have to switch out the reagent. So it's just a one test. So, you know, in their, in their ideal world, you buy several of them or you just use one to test the thing that you need. But, the, you know, so <laughs> like we're just spoiled, first of all. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Yeah. We are spoiled with choice, with opportunity, with selection. And it's just like it's just kind of funny to people, you know, complain that I think I think the Radeon Gen 5 is like two and a half, three years. If I remember, you know, it's more than two years. And it's like that's a reasonable upgrade cycle. And here's the thing, too. If you if your your corals look as good today as they did, or you know, before any new light was announced. Right, it doesn't cheapen yeah. your light. It just pulls at your consumer heartstring that you gotta have the latest and greatest. And the thing is, there's way too more, too much emphasis on people getting the latest and greatest equipment and not having the latest and greatest reef tank with what they do with it. Well, I was gonna say it's it's a tool, and if if you no longer feel good about your reef aquarium because your lights are now the last generation and you don't have the shiny cool new lights if that's what it takes for you to be unhappy with your reef maybe reevaluate what's important you know like look inside your tank go get some nice corals watch them grow that's that's what the hobby is about you know it's just a tool and they're going to make better tools i mean i don't yeah. know it's, and, and, you know, what do you want? Do you want a, a, a quick upgrade cycle so we can have innovations? Or do you want a stagnant catalog that is like super dusty by the time they come out with a new version? You I know, was like uh, just, just take one or the other. I was half tempted because I went on the forums and um, everyone, you know, there's that crowd that's dumping their G5s because they want to get the funding to go buy the G6s. So all of a sudden, the classified Which is ads, funny because there's an upgrade path. There's an uh, yeah. upgrade path. You can upgrade the lights that you have. I just noticed uh, the classifieds had a ton of G5s for sale, and I was half tempted to get, you know, a couple of uh, XR15s if I could find them. But then I was like, nah, my, my even older lights are doing just fine. <laughs> You know, mm-hmm. On the tank down in the basement, not the not the one with the Kessels. But um, and here's the thought for some uh, intrepid entrepreneurs: there's got to be a way to power the 
those those you know lightly used panels of the G5. You may, might not have all the bells and whistles. You might not be able to control every channel, but someone's got to be able to repurpose that, right? And if Ecotech is offering an upgrade path, you know they're basically offering you like most of the light engine. Right in the panel with all the LEDs and all the colors and the lens. Like, I'm not sure what's stopping anyone from making a fixture of their own design to put either the G5s or the G6 inside. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it will take some engineering, but there's going to be a lot of uh, unwanted and lightly used uh, panels of those lights, of Hydras, and so many others that, like, yeah, there's there's a lot of opportunities there. Yeah, I agree. I and I want to make it clear for the record. I have, I still have. Uh, I think I'm still up to like 16 G Gen fours around the studio. I didn't turn around and look at my corals and be like, "Oh my god, you suck!" Now that this light is two generations old, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't have that itch. And in some places, uh, because the corals are growing a lot and there's more self shading, I'm like, "All right, there's a few of these tanks that could use um, a little bit more of that diffuse light." But for example, on my six foot water box, I've got four Gen Four Thirty Pros. I'm, I'm looking at it. I'm like, oh yeah, four or five XR15s are going to cover it perfectly, right? So that's going to drop my power consumption. That's a, a lower overall sticker price. Um, yeah, and then people, you know, bitching that uh, like the Kessel A500 has too much shimmer and it hurts their eyes, and other people bitching that you know other panels have no shimmer and that kills it for them. And I'm like, I'm a fan of shimmer. First of all, I am a fan of shimmer, um, a medium amount or a large amount. I embrace it. But then, you know, I have a sky on one tank. I have another tank that just doesn't have much surface ag agitation. And uh, now the four foot tank that has a G5 and G6 on it, you know, and calls it kind of kills the shimmer a little bit. But I don't, but the tank doesn't look worse. <laughs> it doesn't look worse for it, right? There's, um, it's just one of those romantic things that people either, you know, desperately feel like they have to have or can't live with. Yeah, that's so that's a, a weird one. It's a I have a weird relationship with it because I I probably the best coloration and growth I ever had was from uh, an ATI uh, T5 fixture I had uh, Sun Power, which had uh, eight 80 watt bulbs over a six foot tank, um, and that was a deep tank too. It was like 27 inches wide, 27 inches deep. Like it's not that deep, but um, and it grew coral like bonkers and coloration was phenomenal, but it just was the flattest look. You know, I did not like the lack of shimmer, but it was that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, everything about it was great except for the shimmer, right? The corals were growing and healthy. There was no real shadowy parts of the tank where I couldn't grow anything. Coloration was great. It just didn't have the right aesthetic for me. And so I have a, I love shimmer, but it comes with its share of shortcomings. But for me, I get, especially right now, I'm like mixed reef is good for me. I like keeping, you know, LPS and softies a lot right now. Um, so the shimmer is not a big deal breaker for me in terms of like, I must coat every surface with light, you know, but. But it's, it's aesthetically yeah. speaking. The four foot kitchen sink reef tank that I currently run the Gen 5 and Gen 6 Pros on, um, it had a pair of Hydra 64s and I miss the shadows. I miss the shadows around the corals. It really yeah. helps to frame the corals and gives them like a really nice contrasty feel, you know? So I've been running the skies on my three foot Euphelia aquarium and it, it does give like a little bit of a cloudiness to the water. I, you know, I don't, I can't explain it, but maybe because the light rays are going every direction, more of it is uh, refracted into your eyes. But the, it, you know, okay, the corals are getting the light that they need, but I kind of miss some of those shadows. Like I still want to have coverage everywhere that there's, yeah. you know, corals that need light. But I miss some of those hard shadows because it frames the corals and it makes them pop a little bit more. Like you were talking about uh, scraping the back of your aquarium to just, uh, you know, give it a little bit, you know, show where the, the rock uh, begins and where it ends. And then, boom, you got a nice bl uh, black background. It, it, it's a look. It is mm -hmm. very aesthetic. At the end of the day, I mean, your reef tank is going to grow just fine either way. <laughs> yeah. What do but they I say? Do miss I was going to say, I happiness is the, the uh, absence of choice, right? And the problem is we have so oh, much God. choice now that we're not ha we, we can't find happiness, right? It's like, oh, I love this shimmer, but shadows. Oh, I love, 
you know, these lights grow corals great because there's such a uniform coverage, but it, it just looks so flat and boring and okay. You know, just pick a lane and <laughs> just go yeah, with it. Yeah. So I do miss some of the shadows on that four foot reef tank from the hydros, the pair of hydro 64s. Um, so I don't know. I'll run with the pros for a little while, but, uh, either way, I, most important for me is not the shadows, not the shimmer, not this crazy wide, you know, flawless coverage. Is do, Are the corals looking good? Do they have good color? Do they have good growth? All right, boom. I'm happy. I'm satisfied. Yeah, I would just, um, I'd, I'd like to do more with less. I, I don't, I hate having so many things plugged in. And so, um, you know, we may, we were talking about the Giesemann and those type of lights. One of the great things was those were usually like one or two plugs, right? Usually two if you had like a mm. actinic mm. uh, bulb combo with the halides. And I just, you know, having like to plug in each individual little module of light uh, when LED started to take off, I just wasn't a fan of that. Um, and I'm still not. But I also get that it's hard. Like, are you going to make a two-foot fixture and a three-foot fixture and a four and a five and a six, right? It's 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 a pain in the butt from a manufacturer's perspective to do that too. So I get that, but uh, the sun power, another great. And you example. have to consider that, that was like one plug. It was heaven, you know. <laughs> so no, oh, maybe it's two plugs. I don't know. You also have to consider Ecotech Marine is a global brand, and yeah. they don't just ship lights all over the world. They ship pallets of lights all over the world, and so they have to logistically, they have to you know make that work. For every country, <laughs> for Australia, Singapore, Japan, China, Europe, you know, uh, South America, and all of North America. So it's like, you know, just let the people do what they know best. Yeah, and there's an upside to the modularity, right? If one has an issue and you need to send it in for warranty work, but you have three over your tank, you can get by with two, right? Whereas, um, like when my sun power would just burn through ballast, like there was no tomorrow. All the fans were working fine, but I, I thankfully they had like a YouTube video on how to do it. But I, I think I had to replace a ballast like three times on that thing. You have to like completely mm -hmm. take it apart. And and that was a pain to take that whole fixture down. So stuff happens and it would be nice, uh, at least with the modular type of lighting, like you just take the problem child out, you fix it, but the rest can keep running. So um, you know, there's, there's, you want to talk cons. about expensive lights? Do you remember Sphiligoy? Yeah. Sphiligoy had a controllable ballast. Were they Italian? That, you know, it only dimmed down to 20%. Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Dude, the ballast alone for like a two lamp setup was somewhere like $3,000 and it did no color control. <laughs> it's like if you see all the features we have now and people bitching about, you know, Incremental, you know, price increases and, and and new fixtures coming out while the smaller fixture is smoking what used to be the big fixture, um, or you know the old versions of the bigger fixture. I'm like, dude, the value and performance is like it's not even comparable in economic terms. Yeah, not even like close. You can't. They're not even the same conversation. Imagine a, you know, uh, a, a dual Giesman uh, fixture with T5s built in, then you throw in some Sphiligoy controllable ballast that only dimmed to 20%, but no color control. I'm like, dude, you have like magic in, in a fixture. I'm talking about all LED lights right now, not just radions. All of them, you have magic in a just tiny little panel that doesn't like pump out the heat that we all, those halides, they forced us to have chillers. Yeah, You couldn't have an acro tank without chillers just from the sheer amount of energy you have to put into it and how inefficient stuff was, right? It's like, man, if you really have a long view of how far we've come, the value of all LED lights is just – oh, it's not even a whole other generation. It's just a totally different animal. Yeah, I I miss – I'm nostalgic for halides, but uh... – I tried running halides again in 2015, and wow. I got over that nostalgia. That's recent. Yeah, that was only like seven years ago, and I got over that nostalgia real quick because just the heat, wow. man. Um, what, what did you use? What did you go with? Um, Phoenix, I believe, single-ended bulbs, or – hmm, that's a good question. Um, but I had Vertex e-ballasts, <laughs> which that brand's mm -hmm. not around yep. anymore. 
Um, and then I just had some parabolic reflectors uh, and a ton of fans. Um, I've, I, I ran an aquamatic double-ended fixture for a while. Um, and yeah, it's great, but I mean, you forget how good it is with LEDs, like if you switch back. I mean, I see plenty of people switching back and to each their own, but for me, it was like, I don't know. Sometimes you just can't go back, right? Like you, you, in your head, you get very nostalgic about something and you idealize it. And then you go back and you're like, mm, I forgot about burning my elbow every time I reached into the burning tank. Your or, elbow, all the heat, yeah. the extra cost. Um, not to mention, you got like three months of like sweet, sweet, like, you know, pretty much flat line lighting intensity and spectrum. And then it starts to drop off in intensity and then the color changes too. And that, you know, depending on how many hours and how many times you restrike, um, you know, the timer's ticking every time you turn on that light, uh, you know, what, eight, eight months, 10 months, 15 months, depending on the light and the ballast that you were using. And so like, yeah, let's not forget that replacing bulbs used to be a thing. And that's the funny part is people are replacing LEDs like, like like their old LEDs weren't good enough, and it's yeah. Just, you I saw know, somebody it comment has fueled like the re aquarium hobby. Yeah, they said like replacing LEDs every year is more expensive than replacing T five bulbs, and I'm like, well, that's true, but nobody said you had to replace your LEDs, you know. Um, and the sucky thing about T fives, I tried those and. I could never find a color combo that I was happy with. And it was an expensive experimentation. Like, oh, let me order one more of this bulb and that bulb. And I'll get one more purple plus And let me add a daylight bulb. And I just couldn't find. It always looked very Windexy, like washed out blue. Um, I mean, the corals look good, but this the light itself was not great. And I love with an LED that I just kind of dial it. It's like, okay, there, that's that's a dial. good sweet spot. Let's switch it around. <laughs> yeah. You you know, you forget. And one you thing take I do want to mention to people. Go ahead. One thing that I want to mention to folks is I use a lot of lights. You know, except for the radions that I'm super familiar with and I know what they look like. And I went from hydras to radions, so they had kind of co comparable lighting spectrum. Um, I hate every new light for about two weeks. You've I said get that before. So used yeah. to the way I want my, I get so used to the way my my tank looks and my corals look. You know, if I put uh, like I say right now, I got a max pack jump blue over my uh, actual A can collection. Um, I have tried some other lights on there, and they bring out greens well and they bring out reds well. But I haven't found a fixture that brings out the oranges that dominate that tank nearly as well as the jump blue. That's why I'm like, I am so stuck on that light right now. Um, what did I try? I tried the current USA Orbit Marine, that little kind of you know small box, like 250 bucks. Incredible blue coloration. And it made me want to puke the moment I turned up the whites. Hmm. Something about those white, the kind of 8K, just did not complement the blues at all. I'm like, oh my God, that is the wrong shade of white. And this is all personal preference. I'm sure over time, like, you know, I'll get used to a more pinkish look, but um, was not, uh, I thought the blues were just so great and so rich. And they had hemispherical lenses like the Gen 4s, the Gen 4 Radions, and great spread, small little box. And as soon as I touched the whites a little bit, I'm like, nope, 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 nope. That light was up for about an hour, about an hour. I was like, nope. And I had a similar, uh, you know, reaction to the coral care. I used it over some trees, you know, my mangroves for a, a long time. But then once I got the um, the 500s, the Kessel 500s, um, I put, I hung the uh, I hung the whole coral care over one of my coral flats for 15 minutes. For 15 minutes, I tried it out and I tried, you know, the sliders and the colors, and I'm like. Nope, nope, nope. This is not going to work for me. I am too used to certain spectrum and there's certain other spectra that I just do not want to entertain. You know, just you can, you can, it's not about being set in your ways. It's just like, I want my corals to look a certain way, especially when you have a lot and you know what they want to look like. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Happiness is the absence of choice, man. You've got a lot of choices. In You're that so right. And same thing with it, you know, that really applies to like the fluorescent selection. 
Because if you have four bulbs, six bulbs, eight bulbs, you're always going to be thinking, well, what if I change that one? Mm -hmm. But you don't realize that you're pulling something out in order to put something in. So it's not like you're just adding more color to the spectrum. You have to make those sacrifice, right? So the uh, happiness is the absence of choice uh, really hits home. Yeah. I mean, that's a a one problem with LEDs is there's just too much tinkering right like it's like mm, i don't know maybe if i tweak it two degrees this way or that, that way that, or... that's another thing that i find really astounding is how many people i think that besides like how to take care of algae or how to make my corals more colorful which we did a full session on i get several messages a week on how to program people's lights I, I, I mean, I've done a video out there. I've done, you know, articles out there. So if you Google it, you can find it. And I'm just like, uh, it's not that hard. But that's the other um, hit to happiness is people have so much uh, opportunity to tweak their spectrum that they're just like paralyzed. Yeah. Therefore, almost so many people are just resorting to an AB plus spectrum. They said AB plus and they set the photo period and they make zero changes. And because it's astounding. Uh, because a bunch of people are like, this is a good spectrum. And that gives them in their brain psychology the comfort of like, this is the right choice. Even if they're to their eyes, it's not perfect. They know like, oh, well, this is what everybody else is running. So this is this will be good, you know, and it helps settle that endless debate in your brain of, ah, you know, do I add a little more of this or that? I mean, I'm guilty of it. I, I just this week I tweaked my Kessels again a little bit, <laughs> you know. What I was did you a, uh, What did you change? Uh, I up my greens a little more, out of curiosity, mm-hmm. because when we talked about the whole um, uh, chromo proteins and uh, that one website where people like they basically produce these chromo proteins via bacteria in a lab, and they were talking about which spectrums stimulate. Uh, different um, pigments, yellow was really heavily in the green zone. Um, So I was like, "Mm, okay, well, I wonder if back in the day we just had a little more green in our lights and maybe that's why. Can you explain? Because I wonder if this is going to, I wonder if this is going to help me with my yellow toadstool. Can you explain a little bit more? Because I know that green That's why I did it because I've got two yellow toadstools. (laughs) That's exactly why I did it. I know that green light brings out red fluorescence but what was what did you find out about green light and yellow pigments um there was the excitation um wavelength and then there was i think what was it the expression wavelength or something like they broke down all of the chromo proteins um on a chart and you know what wavelengths were affiliated with the um i think I'd have to look up the website. I, I'll send it to you. But so I started to look and what I found interesting, and this is somebody can tell me I'm full of it because this is just me being a tinkerer. I noticed that the yellow pigments, they were affiliating with, I believe it was like the 500 to 600 nanometer range, which fell into the green zone on your wavelengths. And I thought, oh, interesting, right? So maybe if I pop the greens a little bit on my uh, A500s, would that make my mustardy sarcophyte and elegance start to express more yellow pigmentation and push the to more of a, a yellow, like old school yellow? Because, I mean, those Iwasakis back in the day, they had their share of green. And, um, I mean, those were like, dude, banana-y. I'm like vibrating right now because I can't wait for this session of retherapy to end. So I can run <laughs> over to my yellow toadstool that I've been blasting with deep, deep, deep blue light thinking that that was going to bring out some more yellows. No, it brought I out could more be greens, but I have these individual spotlights. This, right? um, oh, I can test it. I can yeah. start testing it like the moments after this. I have this this suite of different uh, Vital Wave 2 spotlights from Blue Harbor and Eco Lamps from Japan. Now, some of those lights, man, they got a lot of green. And I'm like, that would actually make so much sense. Because we had broad spectrum lights and we had yellow leathers. And the one thing that most of us have cut out is that green light. And that would yeah. make a whole lot of sense if, you know, green light, uh, you know, stimulated 
uh, yellow toadstools to be yellow again. Oh my God, I'm so excited you said that. <laughs> because a couple of the, 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 the spotlights from the Vital Wave 2 have a lot of green in them. I was like, oh man, I, that, that light's a really green. I don't know if I've ever used that. And I'm like, oh my God, now I got the perfect, perfect setup. I mean, the incandescent you know, thing is already there. The, the 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 really deep blue light is already going. I mean, I can just run over there and do it right now. Yeah, I've been inching that would make it sense, up. But that's the fun part. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Why didn't you tell me this specifically? Yeah, made me dig around and ask you on reef therapy. You're gonna wait like two months, but like, hey, look at my bright yellow yellow well, coat I, leather. <laughs> I'd rather. Like, I was more tempted to just. Know. See if it worked. If it didn't, then I didn't, you know, I don't have to look like an idiot. But if it does, then I could be like, hey, check out what I figured out. So, um, yeah, try it. Try I have a perfect use case. Yeah. And I got another yellow toadstool that is perfectly mustard. And it's just one of those colors I'm missing. Oh, my goodness. I'm excited. Well, because it's I'm a excited. And if it works. Yeah. If it works, we can dive deeper into like talking to some of these chromoprotein experts and be like, hey, man, let me tell you about this coral that used to be yellow all the time, but now we don't keep it yellow. I threw a bunch of green on it, and now it's like a canary. Yeah, I, I was uh, tempted to send them an email because, I, you know, the part of the whole gene expression is, you know, could the light trigger that gene expression or, you know, am I still missing a piece of the puzzle? Um, you know, because the coral might be like, mm, well, the amount of green that's in this light mustard is good enough. You know, I, I don't know. I, I really don't know. But I miss the old yellow leathers, right? So I'm like, mm, wonder if it's lighting. Besides like a Pikachu and a Pink Floyd Acro, there's just not that much that's yellow, bright yellow naturally. Like yeah. healthy. And then some of the stuff that's like yellow is usually kind of like a fluorescent, you know, light, light, light green. Right. And there's just, dude, how many times have we even talked about the yellow Fiji toadstool? We're going <laughs> to crusade this thing. This is, this is one of my last, you know, well, one of my current major hurdles and challenges in reef keeping is like, how the frick do we make yellow toadstools again? And the one thing I hadn't considered is like, hey, maybe throw some little more green light at it. But I have the setup, I have the corals, I have the tools, and I can literally report back next week and, and, and see if it moves in that direction. I mean, if somebody had some old Iwasakis laying around and they just wanted to throw what we get as a yellow leather today under some, that would be cool too, right? To see if, because it could just be a collection type thing, right? It's just like. No, because my yellow leathers, they started bright, bright freaking yellow. I specifically they? got them that way and they were bright. And I did an article about it because, you know, what? I kept one under the Kessels in the corner and I don't know if I had my greens up that high. Hmm. I'm not super sure. And it might not have been enough green because it was really balanced in our broad spectrum lighting. Um, to find you have a fluorescent and metal halide lighting where we couldn't pull it out. And now like basically every fixture has just a tiny bit of token green to help uh, um, just balance out the look of the tank, not to, to create certain effects. I'm trying to find the link, but yeah, I'm I'll excited. send it to I'm you. Excited. Um, yeah, I, that's, that was been one of my questions for a long time. And I, I, you know, was it the rise of LEDs that made these uh, beautiful canary yellow corals go mustard yellow? Or like, was it collection locale? But based on what you're saying, you got some canary yellow leathers and they went mustardy on you. So one thing I will say is that the my biggest uh, formerly yellow toadstool um, held its color the longest under the Kessel A500X, probably because I was really daylighting that thing. But I don't know how, I don't remember how far I was pushing the greens. But like I said, I got the perfect setup now and two different colors of spotlights and two different yellow leathers. I can literally just spotlight them and just see what happens. Yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll find it again. Uh it was like this awesome chart that had every uh, GFP and chromo protein, and then it had two columns. And I'll be honest, like one was the, you know, at one point does the pigment like ref get excited by the wavelength of light? Um, and I forget what the other column was, and it's going to drive me crazy, but whatever. Like I'm not going to. Oh, gonna I make... have the Bible of coral coloration right here. 
It's in Japanese. Yeah, I was say, I don't speak Japanese. <laughs> this, is, this is literally all that it talks about. It's you know, coral coloration and fluorescent proteins and chromoproteins. And it's all in Japanese, except there's a couple like random like English uh, sentences at the bottom of certain pages where they're like direct pleas to certain like lighting manufacturers. It's it's really, really funny. But yes, here you can see blue fluorescent protein, cyan fluorescent protein. So I have the Bible in my hands. I just can't read it. And it would take a really, really long time to do like a, a visual translator of each text. And I, I doubt that, you know, all this stuff would uh, um, translate directly, right? We're not asking uh, how to get to uh, the bus stop. <laughs> That's a little bit different. All right, I sent yeah, you. Yeah, that's it. cool, man. Uh, Actually, I found the link that has like I, 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 it's broken down by color, like red, orange, and then the yellows are all in like the low to mid fives, right? And the columns are exc excitation and emission. So, oh well, y'all y'all know what I'm going to be doing <laughs> as soon as <laughs> Sorry. we wrap all it right. up here. No, no, it's cool. But, uh, man, I definitely want to give a little shout out to more than a little shout out to our European editor, Jeremy Gay, who is in uh, Nuremberg for Germany right now, um, you know, helping to scoop some of the newer products that are coming out. I've been kind of surprised because there's been like three testers. There's a smart tester from Refactory that's, you know, basically a water testing robot. Then there's this new company called X Aqua from Poland, not to be confused with X Aqua without the E from Italy that has a full range. I was super confused because their font was really similar. I'm like, oh, X Aqua came out with some photometers. But anyway, this Polish company, they have these really fancy photometers and they have directions on how to get precise measurements in video for every single value using a single photometer. And then uh, ITC Reef Culture, they uh, announced a, a new device called the Parwise which is um, you know, a full new generation version of kind of like the Senai dongle that measured all the things. But this one is specifically just for measuring PAR. Uh, PAR, it'll give you color temperature. That's pretty cool. It'll give you a spectrograph and DLI, daily light integral, which oh, um, cool. calculates how much light, you know, the coral is going to receive over a 24 hour or, you know, the spot is going to receive over a 24 hour period. So I thought it was just super funny that, you know, the three stories that rose to the top just today was like a water testing robot, a water testing photometer and a light tester. I was like, all right, you know, the measurement sensing side of things is really taking off. And as I was writing these stories, besides the photometer, but like I saw the reef tester and I saw the par wise, I'm like, dude. This should have been Neptune Systems. Like, they should have had this ball. They should have owned it. They should have been first out the gate. But, you know, they have a different development cycle from companies like Ecotech Marine, who iterate often. Yeah, you know, Apex likes to uh, really squeeze out the value of the molds that they, and the tooling that they get made for certain products. So, you know, they came out with a PAR meter that uh, only plugs into the Apex and it's still like, I don't know, $350 and just about the same price as the uh, the bare sensor that you could get from Apogee. But mm -hmm. the Parwise is $200. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Like, I'm sure the camera assembly, you know, in most modern smartphones can do all that stuff. And it's, you know, the sensor is only going to cost, a, I don't know, a few dozen dollars, you know, minus all the stuff you put around it to actually make it work. And so seeing a bona fide, you know, light sensor that measures PAR, color temperature, spectral emissions, and calculates the DLI, I was like, oh, yes. There we go, $200, USB, no registration, uh, no app. I think they're going to try to make it work with iPhones, but it'll have to plug in directly because it needs to be powered and connected. Um, but yeah, plug it in your computer. As long as you got you know a modern web browser like Chrome, um, I'm assuming uh, you know other one comparable ones will probably also work. But $200 to characterize your light field. Yes, I, please. Yes, I, please. I'm horrible. And one last thing. One last rant. Yeah. One last rant. Everybody's complaining about the price of whatever reef aquarium product. Dude, start complaining about the coral prices. Start complaining about the coral prices, right? You'll spend how much on a coral, but then you want to complain about the lights that are getting better every year. That means you can actually spend less on them every year. Like, come on, man. Come on. What, what would happen if the, you know, a, a segment of the reef aquarium hobby got together and be like, you know what? The rent is too damn high. 
<laughs> the corals are too damn high, and we are not buying corals this month. What y'all going to do? Right? But the behind the hobby is so big right now, it'd be hard to like mobilize enough people to be like, because it needs to trickle down all the way. It's not the wholesalers. It's not the stores. It's because, you know, people have been gouging for, for prices for whatever they think is a super unique coral strain just because they've been opening up coral boxes for three years. They don't even remember what Fiji was like. And so they see something for the first time like, okay, that's $4,000 now. And right, that, that, the, the, the exporters and the farmers, they see that in, you know, at the source. I'm like, okay, we want a piece of that. Right. And so there's got to be a way to just like uh, tamp things down, tamp things down a little bit. On the flip side, I feel like the um, the people at the source, they deserve most of the money. They are doing most of the work. And then what you're paying for is like uh, freight and freight and freight and boxes and, you know, transit fees and all that stuff. Anyway. Yeah, I'm, that's, I'm, uh, that's my little mini rant right now. I'm cool with frags getting smaller if they were getting cheaper, <laughs> you know, like I don't mind. I was always uh, cool with being patient and growing something out. I, I found joy in that. But then all of a sudden it became smaller and expensive. And I was like, all right, this is getting getting old, but whatever. Um, going back to that uh, par meter that does more than par, um, that's like I, with, especially with LED lighting, like. I don't put like a lot of value in the exact numbers, um, but I do put a lot of value in ranges. And um, that was a real eye opener for me getting a par meter with my LED lights of like how the, the, where I set them based on eyeballing it versus where I set them by measuring. Um, those two uh, intensities were vastly different, right? Um, I want you to dive into that. Um, Un unpack that thought. So coming from somebody that used to love halides and God knows those were probably packing a crap ton of micromoles of par, right? Um, I do see benefit in edging towards the lower end of the range sometimes, uh, especially with things like LPS corals. Like, so my LPS tank only has about 90 micromoles of par on average, um, for the bottom portion of the tank. Let me just say for the, the record, tank. every time you say micromoles, I have a little mini orgasm in my ear. <laughs> I do that just for you. Um, <laughs> but um, I think that um, I, I think that I would be somebody that would wander off into trouble if you gave me these highly controllable lights where I can tune every little thing and I had no reference point to tune with. So... It's like having that guidance of like, okay, I want to have, I don't know, about 200 to 250 micromoles at the top. I want to have maybe you know, somewhere in the 80s to 90s on my sand bed. Um, dialing in the intensity with a par meter was – like at that point, you put it on a shelf and you don't use it for a very long time. But Which is why like a $500 par meter is kind of insane. But if you can get one for two hundred dollars, it's a tough sell. Yeah, if it's two hundred bucks and it does a lot more, I could see the value in that in a great way because it just helps. Like the guys that are and girls that are reaching out to you and getting lighting recommendations, like how do I? What should I? Should I just set these to A B plus? What should I do? Like part of it is just like having the data, right? I mean the Kessels, I have them at like forty five percent intensity, you know, which you get these, really, yeah. And that's that's how I got to having like 200 micromoles just below the surface and having like more like 80, 90 on the sand bed, you know, having like that mixed range. Ooh, man, your your tank, I mean, those measurements are on a low end. They are. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, my acros, the, the you, few that I have look incredible. You know, I've got an ice and fire that's white with blue tips, right? Gorgeous. I've oh, your eyes fire echinata looks like just looks like a I want to say it looks like a picture, but I'm looking at a picture. It just it looks just flawless, just bright white, but with still with some tissue and then those bright blue tips. Mm, mm, got it. That's one one thing ostensibly missing from my collection right now. I'll get you a frag if you want. I'll grow it out a little bit and anyway, but 
Yeah, so I do edge on the lower end, I think. it. I, there's something, I don't know, something that anecdotally I can't explain, but I think it's like if somebody gives you a choral range of like this to that, erring on the low end to me seems like a good idea. But uh, it sounds like we did a whole session about you know, like, overdoing it versus underdoing it, yeah. right? You'll all virtually never get in trouble by aiming lower, right? So when you aim high and you try to, you know, speed and pedal to the metal, that's when you crash. That's when you have problems. That's when you bleach your corals. But yeah, no, I think the, um, the ITC reef culture, uh, par wise, 200 bucks. I'm just like, Part of me is a little bit annoyed that it didn't come out sooner, but I'm like, yeah, this is going to be a hit, hit product. And it's, you know, the other thing that made me really excited is seeing that it calculates DLI because now instead of people taking these point sources of, of light measurements that they don't fully understand, we can just like average that out to yeah. how much light is your tank getting throughout the, for in one whole day. Yep. Right. What, what is the light that the coral is getting throughout the whole day, throughout the entire cycle? And that is its diet for the whole day. That's literally the energy that is feeding the coral. And that's, um, you know, I have like three or four parameters. I was looking for the extra ones today. And, and because I only pulled them out for the extremes. Yeah. I only pull them out at the real low end and at the real high end of of uh, aquarium lighting. And but having a device like the uh, the Parwise that can measure DLI, it's met. You know what DLI is measured in moles per meter squared per day, right? Because it's not micro; it's like thousands and thousands of seconds. And so, like, you can't say uh, I have blah 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 DLI. It's it, it, there's a metric. There's a uh, you know, a measurement for it. And so if people want to talk about DLI, they're going to have to come to the moles party, moles per meter squared per day. That makes me happy. And but that's, yeah, so today's that's a, the first day of... No, I was going to say, that's a good first, uh, deal. <laughs> we're, we're not in sync this podcast, I noticed. We're like more... Uh, our brains are both going at the same time. Um, no, nah, go ahead. Cool. Sorry. I'll let you go. Um, today's the first day of Interzoo, and so there's a lot more new products to come, and we won't be able to post them all up during this week. But, yeah, definitely in the next two or three weeks, it's going to be showtime on Reef Builders in terms of new products, in terms of reviews, in terms of videos. Um, I hope, uh, you know, we just kind of help to shed some light <laughs> On the issue of lighting today, I didn't want to just like get in all in about lighting, but just kind of skirt around it. And uh, I think that we did that pretty well, you know, uh, started off with a little bit of a an audio review of the sixth generation Radeon. So thanks for entertaining that, Mark. I appreciate it. Yeah, I like them. Uh, I, I'm i looking forward to coming to Colorado. What is it? Next month? And, month. Uh, checking them out. Basically a in month. In person. Yeah. You had me at more oh, warm some, whites, <laughs> so that's yes, where I was like, okay. The warm whites <laughs> really helps with the color rendition, and I still have experimentation to do with the G6 blue. Like, there's a little part of me that hopes they drop the G6 and just like, um, uh, let's see, just just call it something completely new. <laughs> so I don't have to say Radeon G6 XR30 W Pro. It's just not rolling off the tongue anymore. <laughs> when you have to tell apart all these different things. But, um, you know, if you guys are interested in more on coverage on the Radeons, I've already got two videos out, probably a third one right around the corner from when this is published. And, um, you know, if you want to learn a little bit more about the new products that are being uh, unveiled in Germany this week, um, we're going to be covered and smothering that on Reef Builders. Plus, I have a lot of really great products that are finally, I've been using for a month or five, Five months that are finally getting, you know, their full on review. That's one thing, like, I usually really get myself very acquainted with a product. I don't, I'm probably not going to do a review until I know certain things that the engineers don't even know, right? To a degree, but I really want to, like, find the alpha and omega of a particular product uh, before I do an actual review so I can figure out its limits, you know, figure out where it breaks because everything's great on day one. Everything's great for that first month, you know. Yeah. You give those products a chance to to wear down a little bit. Uh, you know, things start start to change. But uh, in other news, I am actually I've been running the 400 gallon tank with fresh water with an aquascape, with a sump, with a closed loop for 
I don't know, most of this year. I drained it today to just get rid of that old fresh water in case anything leached from anything. I'm refilling it with clean water and I'm be salting it up. Nice. So it'll be salted up when you get here. And my, my, my entire goal this entire time was just to have at least one frag in there. <laughs> one <laughs> frag in there. big tank with one for, little. <laughs> well, no, that's awesome, my, 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 entire, my entire plan is to build it from one side to the other. Yeah. It's just going to be so unmanageable to try to do it all at once, try to light it all at once. I want to treat it like three different tanks because it's an eight-foot tank that's split up into threes from the bracing on top. So, you know, I'm going to put my my tentative ideas to put four XR-15s over each section. And so I'm just going to start with the, the section for the stag horns on the right side. So when you get here, I don't even know if it's going to have a skimmer. <laughs> and it might be a couple primes when you get here, <laughs> a couple prime lights <laughs> on one end of an eight-foot tank, because I don't want to build a whole reef tank at once. Yeah. And then to be fair, I'm really aiming to build a six or seven-foot reef inside the eight-foot tank. I want to have a lot of open space on the sides for tables and stags to just really open up. But um, yeah, so that's where I'm at building, build, building yet another tank this week. Uh, what 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 about fish? Are you gonna any any current residents that you have that you would like to move in there? I was thinking. I have gajillion yellow tanks, wild yellow tanks. I started hoarding those before it, it shut down. And then right when it shut down, I was able to acquire like 10 big specimens. Maybe it was 12. Um, so I have a bunch of big yellow tanks. But I've had certain reservations about yellow tanks in a couple of my reef tanks, um, especially the gem tanks. Oh, my God. They just had so much erosion. And it's really frustrating when like... I know how to keep a yellow tank alive, and I just think that the, the corals are starving the fish of trace elements. Like, that's how many corals, and because this is the first time I've actually experienced it, but it's also the highest density of corals I've ever had in one tank. And so I have the black tang in the fish system, and I have at least a dozen yellow tangs that are pretty good size. You know, they would be show size um, by today's standards for sure. Um, so I'm like a little gun shy about putting like 10 of them in that tank in case I encounter some of that erosion. Um, and especially with the black tang is like, I only have one and he's big and he's like 16 years old and yeah. so whatever. You just, you're retired to the reef. You just live the, you know, to the fish tank where you can eat all the food you want and you can chase that purple tang. Um, so I was leaning first towards them, like doing a really cool massive school of yellow tangs. Um, but I have such good luck with convict tanks that I'm like, man, I think it would look really cool to put 20 convicts in there, 20 convicts. And then like, you know, one purple tang, oh, there'll still be, you know, a yellow tang will make its way in there. Um, a clown tang is kind of one of my all time favorites that I've never been able to keep oh, alive. Yeah. They're a little bit tricky. I know people, um, you know, so have some success with those, but you know, something like a, a group of powder blues or a group of, of convicts or, um, a group of yellow tangs. That's kind of, it's going to be a lot of surgeon fish, a lot of super high flow fish in there. Um, but I think it actually might be a good, um, place for, um, a kinky rest, Thalassoma kinky vitatum. It's a smaller, um, lunar style wrasse that can get really pretty and, you know, maxes out at about six inches. So not nearly the same, um, uh, big fish that a lunar wrasse will become. Uh, so that's what I'm thinking about. And you know what? Through our, all of our conversations and reef therapy and just dissecting things out, you know, I know people are all about their cleanup crews and it's something that's really been promoted, um, by the industry because it's such easy money and everybody can add a hundred assorted cleanup crews to even like a 20 gallon tank. I don't have a single one, man. I got abalones and I got a ton of stomatellas and then asterinas and astra starfish. And I'm like, yeah, herbivory. That's, that's the way, that's the way to take care of it. So I will definitely um, put a lot of tangs in there. Nice. That's going to yeah, be a, another be... like really tang heavy tank. Like how cool would it be to have like 20 freaking convict tangs just staying in a tight ball and just like hitting this patch of rock and then hitting that patch of rock and, you know, fighting in the current. And then like one powder blue and or one clown tang to kind of like shepherd them around. I'm like, that, I think that would be super cool. Super cool. And that, you know what? The reason I'm finally setting up this 400 is because I feel like I've relearned everything about reef keeping. 
I'm less intimidated by the size of that tank because if there's a problem, it's just going to be a bigger problem. Um, I don't really have problems, you know, knock on all the woods. Um, but all my acros are like busting out of the water of the coral fly. I, like, I could fill that tank instantly if I wanted to. <laughs> it would just be wall-to-wall -wall acros. And that's going to be a fun time, actually. It's a, the most challenging part is I'm really going to be super thorough. I don't really have coral pests, but I really want to do everything I can to never introduce Valonia, never introduce Aptasia, never introduce even any kind of patchy hair algae, even coralline algae I'm like on the fence about, right? But I'm going to be able to cycle this tank, you know, just out of convenience, just let it go. Just let it go. Let it cycle with a couple of primes. Let's salt it up and just let whatever will happen, happen without the introduction of anything. Yeah. Right? I'm not going to ever put any rock in there. I don't ever want to deal with sponges um, or any of the other small nondescript things that, uh, you know, build up over time. Because on a long enough timeline, everything becomes a pest. Yeah, that's true. I. Yep. That's what I got. I've managed to avoid it for a long time, but for some reason I did get a couple of weirdos in recently. And yeah, I've gone nuclear on it just because nip it in the bud, you know, like those. Um... Dude, the in Go ahead. The entire reef aquarium hobby is one of managing all these little fires. Yeah. That's what it is. I'm telling you, my kids. At least my grandkids, they will know a day when reef tanks just have no pests. They won't even be in the books. People won't even know what an aptasia is. They won't know what Valonia is because people will wisen up. And you know what? I've talked about this before, I think on video and on reef therapy. And I've had a couple people, uh, mostly from Europe, send me versions of their, uh, their zero reef tanks, right? So you got NSA with negative space aquascape, zero reef. There's nothing. It's just coral, and it looks freaking amazing. It looks really incredible. I was a little bit jealous of a couple of the tanks that were sent to me. I don't remember their names right offhand, but if they're listening, uh, thank you so much for you know, trusting uh, what I said. And they said, they're, they're just like, this tank is amazing. It's just coral. They don't have to manage anything else. Then there's, there's corals and there's fish and there's a little bit of rock, but this, you know, they started with dry rock and everything, and it's just all the pests are just a distant memory. Makes me very happy. Yeah, it's kind of crazy that Aptasia is still a thing. <laughs> you know, oh when you God. think about it. Uh, well, it's because we're managing them, right? And so even the coral farmers and the coral dealers, they're managing them with Aptasia, with peppermint shrimp, with Bergia nudibranx. And you've seen those frags. You've got, we've, everybody listening here, you've received those frags where it just looks like the cleanest, purest little frag plug with just a coral grown on top. You leave it in a corner for a few weeks, boom, all the algae, all the Aptasia just sprouts out of like the ether in between the ceramic pores. <laughs> of that frag wall. You're like, how is that even possible? Where was it? I looked at it. I inspected it. There was nothing there. There, there. There, yeah. there. Right? An aptasia can be a millimeter long. Right? A full aptasia, tiny, tiny polyp can be a millimeter long. And then when it closes up, it's just like a micro spot, smaller than the, you know, period uh, of, a, of a printed period in text. Yeah. And it's disappointing that, I mean, in my case, I got my first aptasia in like a decade from a true aquaculture vendor you know not not a chop shop so it's like what you know what are you guys doing i mean come on you know they're uh, managing they're yeah managing all the fires and they've managed to suppress it to the point where they might believe that they don't have it and they're sending out those frags i'm like oh here you go there's a bunch of pests for you to deal with yeah yeah, I mean i you brought yeah. up i think it was tropica the that do like tissue culture and freshwater plants um, yes. And, uh, you know, that's the future, man. I mean, just start, start fresh. Or something like it, you yeah. know, I know our, our buddy, uh, Leo, shout out to Leo Denbrigen. Um, he has done a lot of work to try to not just quarantine his corals for pests, which makes economic sense, but also get rid of reef pests. And I'm seeing pictures of his tanks. If I had gone to inner zoo, that's my, that would have been my first stop. Was going to see Leo's farm. Like, yeah, next time I go to Europe, for sure. They, you know, the, the the Netherlands is absolutely on the list because I gotta go see how his stuff is kind of turning out. So nice. shout out to Leo if you're listening. Yeah, cool. I mean, well, what 
No, I got none. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, I think we, you know, uh, dissected and dis- discussed and uh, therapied a few things about uh, Reef Aquarium Lighting. I uh, hope everybody enjoyed the session. Make sure to like us on your favorite podcatcher. And uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, I think there's a lot of people who think they can only watch it on YouTube. Just want to remind everybody that you can listen on your favorite podcatcher. So make sure to rate us, subscribe, tell your friends, and we'll catch you guys on another session very soon. Yep. Sounds good. Bye, Mark. Bye.